All right, lesson six, our last official lesson in Joshua, and then this coming week is going to be just the coolest review lesson where one day you get to look up a bunch of verses about the character of Joshua, and another day you get to look at these great summary ideas so that when we hear the, about the book of Joshua, we're, we're going to be able to think, oh, choose you this day whom you'll serve, right? We're going to have something to cling to. So enjoy that review lesson this week. And our lesson today is called Choose You This Day Whom You Will Serve. And it's interesting because you know God designed humans to worship, right? It's what we were made to do. Whatever thrills and awes us, we worship. Uh, whether it's people flocking to national parks, where they just stand at these beautiful sites and feel small and, and actually worship the beauty that they see. Or we're captured by these sporting events, right? Where thousands of people will gather to see men run around in circles with a ball and a stick on a, on a field. That's, that's worship. We're naturally drawn to put people, uh, movie stars, pastors, politicians, to put them up on pedestals and give them our attention. Anything great and shiny, we want to worship. And, you know, Bob Dylan said it best, right? You're going to have to serve somebody. <laughs> That's my best Bob Dylan. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but we're all going to serve someone. And today the question is put to us, who will we worship? And our central idea, we have the choice to intentionally worship God intentionally kept coming back to me, something that we've set our mind to do. So here's our outline for today. We have three chapters. The first chapter is Eastern tribes are sent home. Then in Joshua 23, he challenges the leaders. And then in the last chapter, Joshua exhorts the whole nation of Israel. So we see in this first chapter, he's sending these Eastern tribes home. The land was fully conquered and distributed to the tribes so they could go back to their families on the eastern side of the Jordan where their land was. They had been with them, they think, about seven years fighting, helping the tribes to conquer their enemies, and they'd been completely obedient and helpful to Joshua. And I kind of wonder if this was a little emotional farewell. You know, these were the men that they had fought right next to in those dugouts, in those battles. These were the true veterans of the army of Israel, and they were saying goodbye to them. And as they go, Joshua is going to give them some directions, some life goals, if you will, ways that they needed to walk, continue to walk in God's blessing. So let's start reading in Joshua 22, 5. He says, only be very careful to observe the commandments and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments, to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So he starts out by saying, be very careful to obey what Moses commanded. So the next question is, okay, what did Moses command? So he lists it. And the order here is very interesting. The very first thing is to give him our love. Next comes the walk of obedience. And, you know, sometimes it's easy to focus on our behavior and what we're doing and totally miss that. God's first desire for us is that we give him our love. We give him our love. And from this love for God will flow a heartfelt willingness to obey and follow him. And then it says that we cling to him. And I hope you guys in your groups had a good time thinking about all the different meanings. You know, I just looked at a dictionary to hold on tenaciously, to have a strong emotional attachment or dependence. I, I think it was Kristen was saying, it was like if you're drowning and someone tosses you a life preserver, you're going to cling to that life preserver. You know, or like, in, I remember I would often get lost as a little child. And so I had a fear of getting lost. And I can remember my dad saying, now hold my hand. And boy, did I hold on to that hand as we went into that busy mall or department store. That's the kind of clinging 
that the scripture is talking to. And as we love and obey and cling, we're going to serve with all of our heart and soul. And he told them to go back with gratitude and generosity. In verse 8, he said to them, Go back to your tents with much wealth and with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, iron, and with much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. Don't just keep it all. They were wealthy from all these towns that they had conquered. So off they marched back to their families with these practices in mind that would keep them in God's blessing. But then the plot thickens, right? Verse 10, when they came to the region of the Jordan that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gab, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. And this was significant, not just because of its size, but because the meaning of an altar. An altar was a place of sacrifice. And Israelites and pagans knew that. That's what an altar was for. So what are they doing? The only place an altar should be built is where God intended it to be. Verse 12, when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. And this whole story, we have so much to learn from the Israelites' response to. Now, the Israelites blew it all over the place, and we, we read all about that, but this is one place where, boy, they really got it right. They really got it right. Their readiness to fight this battle shows their courage to confront wrong, to confront sin. But they were willing to stay cool-headed enough to speak to them personally, not just to hear about them, but to personally go to them. And that personal confrontation shows God's love. So they send Phineas and his ten, and ten chiefs from each of the tribe, so wise. They said, let's go talk to him. And so they went to those tribes. And they said, don't you remember Peor? Don't you remember Achan, these times that we sinned and God's wrath poured out on us? Phineas knew that God knew the sin of these tribes was going to reflect on the whole nation. It was true. And then in verse 19, they make a really bold offer, and it was kind of easy to miss. It says in verse 19, but now, if the land, this is Phineas talking to them, if the land of your position is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land, where the Lord's tabernacle stands. Take for yourself a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord or make us as rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. So do you understand this invitation they were saying? You know, it would mean a much smaller inheritance for the Western tribes. They were offering to give up some of their lands. If where they were located on the east was causing them to sin, he was like, come on over. Come on over to our side and we'll sacrifice to help you, to help their brothers be free from sin. And, you know, too many of us, myself included, it's easy to lack this willingness. It's easy to tell people to stop sinning, right? But are we willing to help them, even if it costs us something? You know, recently I have a friend who became aware of the fact that his good friend was struggling with alcohol. And he did the godly thing. He was able to confront him and say, you know, you need to do something about this. But then he went one step further and he says, I'm going to go with you to AA meetings. I'm going to give up a weeknight every week for your healing. I heard of another a community group of young people where one of the kids was addicted to drugs and couldn't afford a rehab program. The community group became the rehab program. They were around the clock helping this kid. They were digging in to help. And, you know, I thought, you got to be pretty enmeshed in Christian community to participate in this. You have to be enmeshed when it's you that needs the restoring or when it's a brother or sister that needs that restoring. So that's, that's why there's this urge to be connected to other Christians, either in your local church, in your community groups, 
here at CBS so that we can do this. We can not only just confront sin, but walk them by the hand back into restoration. I just love that they did that. But the Eastern tribes answer, verse 22 and 23, they say, The Mighty One, God, the Lord, the Mighty One, God, the Lord, He knows. And let Israel itself know, if it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, don't spare us today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord. Or if we did so to burn offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings, may the Lord Himself take vengeance. They said, you know what? The Lord knows. The Lord knows the truth that we have not turned from him. And you know, sometimes when we're misunderstood, that's our only comfort, is that God knows. God knows our heart. And they went on to explain that their altar was not for burnt offerings, but a witness. They feared that the next generation, the kids were going to say, you guys over there, you don't have any part in following God. You're not in the promised land, right? They wanted this altar to stand as a memorial that tribes on both sides of the Jordan are worshiping the one true God. And war was averted by an honest conversation. And you know, sometimes this can feel miraculous. I don't know if you've ever seen a conflict resolved in a miraculous way. And these leaders were pleased. They were convinced that God was not going to judge them. They knew the Lord was among them. Because unity had been restored, and they all went home with a great report. They were all choosing to intentionally worship God, and they had a witness for the future generations. So I just found this little summary of principles for responding to misunderstandings, just like they did in this case. We respond with a concern for God's holiness. We respond with the courage to confront in love. We don't just kind of say, I know something shifty is going on, but maybe somebody else will take care of it, right? We confront. We respond with an attempt to reconcile before you fight. We're good at fighting, especially on Facebook, especially on social media. We're real good at fighting. But we can attempt to reconcile before those mean words go out. Determine that you're willing to sacrifice to help them. Don't confront unless you're willing to help them. Determine that you'll see the situation from the perspective of the other person. And determine that you're going to believe the best of the other person. That's hard. That's hard. But that's what these people of Israel did, and war was averted. And you know, we get so suspicious in Christian circles of brothers and sisters that worship differently from us, don't we? What's wrong with that other church? And you know, if we believe that the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from sin, we are one. And we can reason together at, at our altar, the foot of the cross. Whatever our church tradition is, if we all come together at the altar and we can leave debates behind because the whole body of Christ can choose to intentionally worship God as one. So the next chapter, Israel comes and gathers and Joshua challenges the leaders. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old. Didn't he say that in the last? (laughs) Okay, now it's true. Now it's really true. I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it's the Lord your God who has fought for you. You know, scholars think it might have been about this Chapter 23 might have been about 25 years after those eastern tribes went home. So this was a while. So now he's really, really old. And he was giving his farewell address. And much like his encouragement to those eastern tribes, now he's going to give encouragement to the leaders of Israel. How will they succeed? How can they continue to walk in God's blessing? So I just... I just wanted to share some characteristics for faithful worshipers of God. And number one, total, absolute obedience to the word of God. Verse 20, chapter 23, 6. 
Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right or to the left. It said they needed to be strong so they could obey. Some of the other translations translate that word to be courageous to obey. And some even, some translations of that word definitions are firm, rigid, obstinate. Be obstinate to obey God. In the book of Isaiah, he says, I've set my face like flint, like a stone. I am going to obey God. Because following God in his word isn't something for the weak. It's true. We need this steely tenacity of faithfulness. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus as we run this race that he has for us. And I just ask, where are places that you need that tenacity to obey? I know through this study, God's brought up some in my heart. Where is that what we just need to be strong and courageous to obey? Well, number two characteristic for faithful worshipers is we don't get comfortable with the enemy. Verse 7, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the name of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. And then later in verse 12 and 13, if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you but they will be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. One of the commentators said, what today is only an innocent Canaanite in our lives may become a torture and a snare tomorrow. And, you know, this is a point of tension for us as followers of Jesus because we are called to love, serve, and even befriend sinners. Yes, we're called to do that, to be a godly influence among sinful people. But how can we discern when they've begun to influence us? That's where we need the Holy Spirit. That's where we need Christian community around us to say, Hey, now, you were going to that bar to witness, right? You know, what's going on? Let's keep, let's keep each other sharp. What are we doing? And, and as we do that, the Holy Spirit's going to guide us as we seek to be an influence among sinful people, but not let the world influence us. Number three characteristic, we cling to the Lord. Verse 8 to 10 says, To the people, to the leaders of Israel, he says, You shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. And as we are obeying and clinging to God, We're going to see God fight for us. Have you guys ever seen God fight for us? How he just solved a situation that you were powerless to solve? He's going to be doing that as we cling to him, as we obey him. And number four characteristic is to cultivate love for the Lord. It's like he said to that eastern tribe, be very careful to love the Lord your God. Wow. Be careful to love God. That is, that is a cool commandment that God has given us. It made me think of the Shema prayer that Jewish people start out their day and end their day with. It's from Deuteronomy 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And remember when they asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment? That's what he quoted. The greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with everything that you are. And I don't know about you, but that's pretty astounding to me to think. The God who created the universe, the stars, the heavens, that his tender heart 
desires that you and me love him. He wants our love with all that we are. He's such a tender God. That means something to him when we love him, when we give him our lives. I just think it's so, so amazing that that's his first command. And number five characteristic is we believe in the promises of God. Number four, uh, verse 14 says, and now Joshua says, I'm about to go the way of the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. We can trust our faithful God with the promises that he has given us. His continual presence, strength, in every trial, that he hears every prayer and his heart is affected and he is working on our behalf. We can trust his promises. But Joshua continues, know if you turn back that God's not going to drive out the nations and you're going to be wiped out. Verse 15, just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. Whoa. I don't know if that was like, whoa. If you break the covenant with God, his anger and his wrath will cause you to perish off the land. Now, is that, is that how God deals with us today? This, that's a good question. Because I think a lot of people, even in the church, can kind of operate on like a karma mentality. You know, good comes around good and bad. If I stub my toe, oh, God must be mad at us. But we relate to God under a different covenant. Hebrews 8 calls it a new and better covenant. Amen to that. And by this covenant... Jesus redeemed us from this curse. And you know, it wasn't until this morning that I finally got around to looking up this one reference that I had in my notes, and it floored me. I have to, I have to pause and just read this to you from Galatians 3. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who's hung on a pole. So that's, that's what was happening at the cross. All of this curse that was promised to God's people for disobedience, it was all poured on Jesus. And we're here today forgiven, accepted with a new and better covenant. We can live a, a forgiven life. Romans 8 says, no condemnation now hangs over the head of those who are in Jesus Christ. For the new spiritual principle of life in Christ lifts me out of the old vicious circle of sin and death. I feel like we just say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah for what Christ has done. And looking at this book of Joshua is a picture like we can appreciate it. Now we understand because honestly, if we were back in that day where good deserved good and bad deserved a curse, I'd be under a curse. I know I would be under a curse. And you know, we experience God's faithfulness to correct us sometimes as a loving father. We can miss God's blessing if we're not abiding in Jesus, but we never have to fear God's curse or his condemnation if we have received Jesus, if we have surrendered our lives to him, because of his redemptive death, we are not under the curse, and we have the choice to intentionally worship God. Hallelujah. I feel like we should just have a little praise choir. Just do a little dance. All right, the last section, Joshua's exhortation to all of Israel. And, you know, they don't know if this is part of the same address in chapter 23, but there's a good chance since no specific place was mentioned in 23, it could have just been part of this. This whole thing happened at Shechem. And remember, Shechem was that place where the, um, they gathered 
in, um, earlier in Joshua between the two mountains, the mountain of cursing and the mountain of blessing, and there was this amphitheater where he could speak. And Joshua starts out with a history lesson. Chapter 24, he starts out telling, reminding them of his faithfulness to those patriarchs, that their forefathers came from the other side of the Euphrates River and they worshiped pagan gods there. They needed to remember that, where they came from. He reminds them of God's faithfulness in the escape from Egypt. They were slaves. God's faithfulness in the wilderness. Four years they wandered and he sustained them. And then finally he reminds them of God's faithfulness in the land of Canaan. Verse 12, I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites. And it was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. And you know, there's a sense in which every blessing is undeserved, right? But somehow this really, this feels a little more obviously so, right? They did not deserve this blessing. When they enjoyed vineyards and olive orchards, it should have made them especially grateful for undeserved blessings. So Joshua moves on to what their response should be to this overwhelming blessing. And it's our memory verse. Let's say it together right now. Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They had to make a choice. Everyone serves some kind of God. And Joshua says, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And the English uses a future tense here that we will serve the Lord, but the Hebrew has a fuller meaning. It's a continuous action. It involves the future, but it also points to the past. It might have been more accurate to say of Joshua, I have chosen and I will choose. And Joshua could make that statement because he had lived a life that continuously chose to serve the Lord. And this week, as you review, you're going to get a great big picture of that. But here's some of the ways. Joshua chose to fight the Amalekites. Back in Deuteronomy 17, when Moses held up his arms and they won a great victory, that was Joshua choosing to be faithful. Joshua chose God's presence. Remember, he would stay at the tent where God had just spoke to Moses. Joshua, Joshua chose to serve the Lord by serving Moses. He was humble. He was like his right-hand man. Who knows what? Go get my coffee, Joseph. You know, that was the kind of stuff he had to do. Joseph cho J Joshua chose to believe God's promises about the promised land, right? He's the one who gave a good report against the whole majority of guys. He said, we can take that land. Joshua chose to recognize the leadership of the captain of the Lord's army. Remember, at the end of Joshua 5, when the captain came, he chose to surrender to his plans for how they were going to fight Jericho. Who knows? He could have had a whole battle plan in mind. But God says, this is the plan, and Joshua surrendered. Joshua chose, last of all, to take leadership of Israel and lead them into the land. He took on a very difficult task with courage. So he could make that statement that I have chosen and I will choose because he lived a life that chose the Lord. And I thought, what about us? What a great exercise for a Sabbath reflection. What are ways in your life that you've chosen God? I'm praying God will bring that to mind. I chose God when I took this job, not that job. I chose God when I chose not to be friends with that group of people, even though it was really sad at the time. Think back in your life how you have already chosen to follow God, and that's just going to propel you into the future to this practical determination that we will serve the Lord. And he says, as for me and my house, do our kids know how we feel? Do they know this? You know, if you have kids at home, do you talk about the Bible? Do you pray together? Sundays or Saturday nights for Tricia are for church. 
That's, no matter what the sporting good is, there's value in gathering as a family of believers and worshiping God. Being generous with your finances. Do you share with your kids? You know, we're not going to take maybe this extravagant vacation because we want to give to this project that we're giving to. Are we concerned for hurting kids? Going on mission trips, serving in homeless shelters, take those kids with you. Show them, let the family see joyful, adventurous hearts that will inspire them to take up that baton of faith. And I know a lot of us, we're still waiting to see how God is going to work in that story if that baton is taken. But God is faithful. And if we declare, as for me and my house, he is going to work in our kids' lives. So the people respond, yes, 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 we'll serve the Lord. But then Joshua has a very surprising response, didn't he? He cautions the people against a lightly made commitment. He's basically saying, ah, you can't serve God. Be sure you know what you're saying. And I don't think he was trying to discourage them. I really don't. I think he was trying to discourage a light commitment to what they were doing, to following God. They were going to serve God under a covenant that promised they would be cursed for disobedience. And I thought, you know, how do we take our commitments lightly? How do we describe a life of faith to others? It's easy to talk about, you know, how we know God's love and his forgiveness, but essentially following Jesus, making that decision to surrender, is described as a death. It's, it's a chance for us to die to our old self. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This call to this life of faith, of loving and serving God, it's a huge act of surrender. We're not just adding a little Jesus to our lives, right? He's the center of our lives, around which all decisions are made. And it's a huge act of surrendering all that we are to him, living for his glory, and our joy. That's what we're calling people to. And that's what Joshua was, was calling them to. And I'm just going to skip over. He set up a monument for them to remember this covenant that they made. Reminding them of their choice to worship God. And you know, like I started out, I said that we worship what thrills us, right? What thrills and fills our hearts with awe and wonder. We're just drawn to that. So it's one thing to say, I'm going to worship God. But the challenge I have for us today is, what is it that draws you into worshiping God? You know, is it hearing stories of answered prayer? I love being around people who are always seeing God work. That just fills my faith, my faith tank. Spending time in creation.